All right, so I'm here with Leslie Newman, who is a children's author, um, including the main focus of today's conversation, which is Heather has two mommies, um, which we can see in the corner of Leslie's screen there. Um, so my first question for you is about Heather has two mommies. Um, I know that this book has undergone some changes since its initial publication. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk about how and why and when you made some of those changes and what that was like as an author. So I, I think we have to go back a little bit and first talk about Heather's conception so that then, then we can talk about the changes. So um, the book was written in 1988, right? So that was a long time ago. And um, while I'm proud of the original edition, I, I like to think uh, 25 years plus later, I'm a better writer. And so when the book um, went out of print briefly, because the press, um, Allison, well, the original press was actually in Other Words Press, which was um, run by my friend Sivia Gover. Sivia and I actually co-published the book in 1989 because nobody would publish it. And so we decided to take it on on our own. And then six months later, Allison Publications uh, took it over from us. And then I believe it was maybe 2013 or something like that. The book temporarily went out of print and then it was picked up by Candlewood Press. And that is the point where the changes were made. So the, the biggest change, which is obvious, is that there are now full color illustrations, brand new illustrations, um, which are beautiful. I love Heather's purple cowgirl boots, which she proudly marches through the whole book wearing them. Um, but so the biggest change for me comes, uh, there's a page where Heather is at story time at, at her school and the teacher happens to be reading a book about a child with a father who's a veterinarian. So the children who have fathers start talking about them. And originally it said something about Heather looks around, she realizes she, or wonders, is she the only child without a father? And her forehead wrinkles up and she begins to cry. So in the new version, I realized, you know, that's not really anything to cry about. So it's more, I took that out and Heather just kind of looks around and wonders. She's just curious, am I the only child here without a father? So I just decided that Heather didn't need to be upset about that. She could just be curious. Yeah, I think that's super powerful. Um, and what what else in the illustrations besides being in color? What are your favorite things about the updated illustrations? Well, I particularly like that one of the moms kind of looks like me, right? <laughs> she has glasses. She has she has curly brown hair, though she wasn't modeled on me. I love Heather's pets. She has a cat and dog. Um, I mean, I love the pets in the original version too. Um, but it's just, it's really cheerful. It's really kid friendly. Um, Heather just looks proud and confident throughout her story. And that's what I like best about it. I think that's really meaningful. Um, I know for me, I'm very much not artistically inclined and I always just appreciate so much how illustrators are able to convey so much of the story visually. Um, I'm always so impressed with that skill. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, I write like one sentence and an illustrator has to come up with an entire painting. It's kind of amazing, <laughs> you know, and it's always a wonderful surprise to see what they come up with. Mm -hmm. um, and so now I know Heather Has Two Mommies was your first children's book. You'd written other works, but this was your first children's book, right? Correct. And so I read that you, you know, when, when the idea came to you from a, a conversation with somebody who was a, a a, a mom and a family with two moms, um, that there were no books to represent their family. You, you decided to write it and went to the library and, and studied up on children's books. Um, so what did you take away from that study session for lack of a better word? And, and what have you learned about writing children's books since then? Well, you know, I think that the first edition of the book maybe was a little um, didactic. And so I also tried to kind of take that preachiness out of, out of the book, but I'm a poet and that's my first love. And I was writing poetry for adults um, long before I wrote children's books. And so what I learned was that there's a lot in common between those two forms. So uh, the obvious is shortness, right? Succinctness of, of words. 
um, uh, language, um, be the beauty of the language, um, poetic techniques such as repetition and rhythm and alliteration. But, but the key really is the page turn. So the page turn is very much like a stanza break in a poem. And so when you're reading a picture book, you physically have to do something to go on, right? You have to like pick up the page and turn it. So you have to make sure that that's worthwhile, right? So it's not that every page has to end in a cliffhanger, but you have to make sure that your reader is curious. That's, there's that word again, um, and wants to turn the page to see what happens next. That's really interesting. Um, thank you. I, I am a preschool teacher. I work with two and three year olds. Um, and so I know that it, it, you know, they, they, they love books, but they also, um, are still developing that focused attention. Um, so that idea of really trying to keep them involved is, is, is so important. Um, and on that note about your other works, um, do you have a similar kind of process throughout all sorts and all different types of books you write? I mean, you write nonfiction, you write fiction, novels, poetry, children's books. Do you have a consistent process or a consistent kind of start, middle, and end, or does it all just depend on what it is? So there's a very famous quote. Unfortunately, I can't think of who said it, who originally said it. I think it's been attributed to many people, but this is my process is that I stare at a piece of paper until three drops of blood form on my forehead. That is my writing process. <laughs> it hasn't changed pretty much since I was eight years old and started writing poetry. Um, I just sit with, I still write with a pen, a pen, notebook, and I just start. If, you know, if, in, if I'm working on something, I'm actually happiest because then I can go back to what I've been working on. If I'm between projects or I just finished a project, then I just scribble until an idea emerges. I have actually, I know people always say that can't possibly be true, but it is. I have a very hard time coming up with ideas. But once I do have an idea, I revise endlessly. Um, a writing teacher of mine used the word pester. He said he pesters his writing. So everything I write goes through between 20 and 30 drafts. You know, I'm a real stickler for for language, for rhythm. I, I write a lot in rhymed verse for kids. Um, and so people think that the rhyme is the tricky part, but what's really tricky is the meter and the rhythm. So it's like developing an ear for music. I read out loud what I write and I actually have somebody else read it out loud to me because I know how I want it to sound, right? I know where the stresses should fall, but if someone else puts them in differently, then I know that you know I've got to work a little harder. But the process is just the same. I just put down, you know, one word and then I put down another word and I just keep going. And hopefully something emerges that's um, worthy of the, of the, that improves the beauty of the blank page. I love what you said about the, the rhythm and the meter. Um, I have a copy of Mommy, Mama and Me and Daddy, Papa and Me in my classroom of, of two and three year olds. And um, I mean, I love reading it to them because it, it, you know, my kids are young, the kids in my class are young and the language is, is simple and it's short. Um, a lot of times children's books are wordy and that's great for older kids, but, but with those two books, it's nice for the, for the younger ones too. Um, I was actually asked to write both those books by a publisher and my assignment, which I accepted, I'm like Jerry Garcia, accept every assignment, um, <laughs> was a hundred words or fewer. Okay. So. Okay. And that's challenging that, you know, because the book still has to have a beginning, middle and end. Right, right. Um, I want to tell you a, a funny story about reading that book to, to my class. Um, there was there was one page where um, on one or on, on, you know, the book is open on one side of the page. It had it had both dads. And then on one side of the page, it had one of the dads. Um, and so throughout the book, we kind of talked how how many daddies are in this family. And, um, you know, they, they were saying there's two daddies and they were so excited to see this possibility of a family with two daddies. And um, on that particular page where they're both on, on one side and then one of them is on the other side, um, one of the kids said, now there's three daddies. <laughs> <laughs> His excitement That's just went up and up and up. <laughs> um, well, I also heard, I loved this story that there was a family of two dads 
and they had twins. And so if on, you know, each double spread, sometimes it's a different scene. So they thought there were twins in the book and they just, you know, what, what happens with these books is that kids really want to see themselves in the book. So they will just, their brains will manipulate it in whatever way serves them, you know, and I, and I love that. Exactly. I love that about those more simplistic and less wordy children's books, because it really does allow them to, to put themselves in and, um, and really see themselves. And on that note, um, I know you have talked about not really seeing any representation of, of Jewish children or Jewish families. Um, I come from a Jewish community too. I'm Jewish. I work in a Jewish preschool. Um, so that plays into a lot of what we do. Um, and I know there are a lot more books out there now, but can you talk a little bit about representation and what that A, means to you now and meant to you as a child and also how you hope to provide that and what you hope that means for children? So, you know, my experience growing up, I grew up in the 1950s and 1960s reading Dick and Jane. And, um, you know, in my school, there were a Christmas tree and Easter bunnies, you know, all that stuff, public schools. Um, so I just always felt other, I felt invisible. I felt like my family wasn't as good as all the other families, even though I grew up in a very Jewish neighborhood. I grew up in Bright Beach, so I was eight. And then we moved to a Jewish neighborhood on Long Island. So even though I was surrounded by families that pretty much looked like my family, ate the same foods, celebrated the same holidays, the message I got from the media was stronger than my direct experience. So I would ask my parents things like, why can't we have a Christmas tree? Why can't I have an Easter bonnet? And I'm sure that was very painful. But my parents, to their credit, were, you know, they were very, very strong in our Jewish identity, even though they weren't particularly religious. But they, you know, they would say things to me, those aren't our holidays. You know, these are our holidays. So and I remember the first Jewish children's book I saw was when I was 27 years old. I was in a bookstore and there was a book called The Carp in the Bathtub, which my grandmother used to tell stories of making a filter fish and keeping a carp in the bathtub. And I just read this book with tears streaming down my face. I was 27. So when I think about what that meant to me at that time, I just imagine what it would mean to a three-year-old to see a family like theirs in a book. And that you know, kind of brings me back to why I wrote Heather. It's just so important. Um, you know, there's the whole concept of windows and mirrors, you know, a child's a book is a mirror when a child sees themselves, a book is a window when a child sees families that are not like their own, and both are extremely important so that um, a child can feel validated. And a child can also be educated about, you know, all the different kinds of people and families there are in the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and again, coming back to, to Heather, um, I mean, this was one of the most banned books of the 90s. Is that right? Challenged. Yeah. Challenged. The, book, the book gets challenged, whether it actually gets banned depends on what happens okay. during the challenge. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I want to ask you again, a kind of two part question here. One, you know, to be an author, you have to put yourself into your work. You have to go through, write it has to mean something to you because why go through the effort of writing it and publishing it, especially if, you know, the, the amount of effort you had to put into publishing it, why go through with it if it doesn't mean something to you? So first part, what did that feel like to have that, have that backlash on that personal level? And then on a larger level, more on an activist level, um, what was it like to, to see that reaction and, and, and how did it feel? What did you do? Well, you know, I was really stunned by the whole thing because nobody would publish Heather. So I just thought nobody really is going to care. You know, it's going to make its way into the homes of lesbian families, which it did. And they'll be grateful for it. And, you know, that'll be the end of it. And then, you know, to see Connie Chung talking about my book, she was a famous newscaster. I don't know if she's still on the air with its, its own logo, the rainbow curriculum and its own theme music. And it was just, it was, you know, things got really wild and kind of crazy. I was on the Montel Williams show. Uh, there was a fist fight in the lobby. I mean, it was just wild. Um, I heard about the book being uh, stolen from libraries, returned from libraries with its pages glued shut, defecated upon and left in the library bathroom. I mean, just all kinds of things. Um, so 
you know, that propelled me into being an activist. I mean, one could possibly say that just writing the book was the, the work of an activist, but I didn't really think of myself that way at the time. I was just thinking that, you know, I was asked to write a book. I saw the need, I figured it out, um, you know, with help from friends, you know, we found an illustrator, my friend Sibby and I, be, you know, became the co-publishers, we found a printer, etc. And then, you know, things just got heated, I will, I'll say, and people got, um, you know, they used the book for their own personal agendas. Um, there were like this guy, Lon Maven in the state of Oregon blew up the cover on a huge placard and was parade, parading it around saying, this is like the demise of Western civilization as we know it. I was called, you know, the devil. I mean, it just kind of went on and on and on. Um, which I always point out to people, if you turn to the page in the book where, where Heather and her classmates draw pictures of their families, and the teacher says, and this is the big message of the book, very controversial, the most important thing about a family is that all the people in it love each other. You know, that's the takeaway. So if you find that controversial, that's something that I think you need to look at, you know, <laughs> because kids who become adults, kids, babies don't, you know, like think of a newborn baby, like a luscious newborn baby, right? So cute. And that baby even though it doesn't have language yet, they don't think, oh my God, how did I wind up in this family? This is not a heterosexual family. That's the way it's supposed to be. I mean, kids don't have any concept of that, right? Kids think immediately they know, these are the people who love me. These are the people who are gonna take care of me. These are the people who are gonna keep me safe in the world. There's no preconceived notion that that should be a mom and a dad or two moms or two dads or grandparents or a single mom, a single dad, a transgender person, whoever it is, as long as they love that baby, that's what matters. See, now I'm on my soapbox. So, <laughs> so, so, but to, back to your question, so I decided that if I wasn't going to defend my book, who would? You know, like you said, it's very, it was very important to me to write this book, to put it out in the world. And so I, be, I came up with this talk called Heather's Mommy Speaks Out, Homophobia, Censorship, and Family Values, which I started giving in probably 1992. And I just gave a few, maybe two months ago. So how, how long is that? 30 years I've been giving the same talk. <laughs> <laughs> Never thought I would still be giving that talk. I mean, I've updated it, obviously. But um, now is really frightening. I mean, back then, like in the 90s, there would be like maybe one irate parent who heard that their kid's classroom contained Heather has two mommies or their kid's school library contained Heather has two mommies and they got upset or they tried to get it out of the public library by, you know, they filled out a form and the, the librarian would take it to a meeting of the board of trustees or the board of directors and they would discuss it. And usually the book would stay in the library. Now what's happening is that it's all become very political in a scary way, like Florida with the don't say gay bill, right? Now you can't read a book like Heather has two mommies in the first kindergarten, first, second, or third grade, or you can get fired. I think you can get arrested. I'm not really sure what can happen there, but whatever it is, is just, you know, absurd. Um, and people are running for school boards, particularly to get their classroom to reflect the world that they wish they lived in, but they don't right? They don't live in a world that's all white, that's all cisgendered, that's all heterosexual, that's all able-bodied. Um, and they, for some reason, want people to change the world, especially the vision there and put their vision of the world out there for children. And it's really unfair to children because it's a lie. That's not the world we live in, right? That's not the world I particularly want to live in, but be that as it may, you know, your desires are your desires, but the fact is reality is that there are all kinds of people in this world and there needs to be a place for all kinds of people and all kinds of families in this world. And, you know, they always use the word indoctrinate. Well, who is indoctrinating who? You know, it's, it's just, it's just not true that the world is all white, able-bodied, heterosexual people, I'll say it again. And um, to teach that to children is a huge disservice. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And to show, you know, to, to paint that picture of the world, um, only, only increases the likelihood of more hate, more discrimination, right? When children don't see what the world actually looks like so that then the first time they inter they, the first time they come across with somebody who is visibly genderqueer or something, you know, their reaction is going to be much different than if they have seen somebody like that person in books or in movies or in media. Um, Absolutely. Um, so I, I was going to ask you about um, that that line in the in the book. The um, you know what really matters in a family is is that everybody loves each other. Um, and you talked a little bit about um, you know how children come into the world and what they need from from the adults in their lives. And and you talked about giving talks about all of this. Um, so what, what would you say to, to teachers um, or families who are really struggling with teaching children about the diverse and, and multifaceted forms of identity that exist in our world, but are being told by their state or school board or community that it's wrong and that they shouldn't? What what words of wisdom, what advice do you have for how to keep keep fighting the good fight? Yeah, you know, I wish I had some words of wisdom. I wish I had an answer to this growing problem because it's just, it's, it's so frightening to me. And I certainly, you know, don't want anybody to lose their job because they have my book in their classroom. I mean, you know, that thought just, just upsets me so much. Um, you know, I remember talking to a young gay man who, you know, every day, would get beat up at school every day. They would, you know, his head down the toilet or he was slammed into a locker and all of those things. And he just said to me, you know, if there was just one book in my classroom, it could have saved my life. You know, he didn't commit suicide, but he thought of it. He absolutely thought of it, you know? And I, I just think that all kids, especially the most vulnerable among us really have to be our priority. I mean, we have to stand up for them because, you know, I remember when I was growing up, a 10 year old kid um, killed himself. He hung himself by a phone cord. You know, we had those curly phone cords back then. I don't know if it was because he was gay. My suspicion is that it, it was. I remember he was a beautiful child. Um, and, you know, I just, in Judaism, you may be familiar with the saying, if you, save one life, you save a world, you know? So every child that we lose, we lose a whole world. And, you know, every life is valuable and we have to do what it takes to save those lives. It's really, really important. You know, I, I, I know that's not really practical advice. I don't really know what to say. Um, you know, I think it's really important to surround yourself with support um, whether that's other teachers, your administration, parents. I mean, you know, every parent in Florida, I'm picking on Florida tonight, doesn't, doesn't support the don't say gay bill, right? So, you know, I mean, and we shouldn't have to fight this. I mean, it shouldn't even be in existence, but, you know, we're so tired. You know, I just, I've been giving this talk for 30 years. Um, we have to band together. We have to be strong. We, ha we have to take care of ourselves, put your oxygen mask on first, <laughs> but we have to keep fighting the fight because it's the children who lose out, right? And it's not only the children who have two moms or two dads or a transgender parent. It's all children because all children deserve truth and all children deserve to see the world as it is. That's very powerful. That's very powerful. And thank you for for that response. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, I'm gonna follow that up with my, hard to follow up, but um, my last question for you, which is a little bit of a, a lighter note um, about, I know, so I know you mentioned the, the carp in the bathtub, but I'm wondering about some of your, I won't ask for one, cause I, if you have one, that's great, but I know that can be a tough question. Um, either as a child or as an adult, one or more of your favorite or most meaningful children's books in your life? Mm. You know, it's so funny. Somebody else asked me this question to just today. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just, it's always so hard, but, I, but I'll tell you, it's not a picture book. The, the book that meant the most to me was, and I have it right behind me, The Diary of Anne Frank. You know, I grew up 10, I was born 10 years after the war, war ended. 
And I probably read her book when I was around 12, maybe 13, about the age that she was when she was keeping that diary. And I just felt like that could have been me, you know? So that, you know, I schlepped my copy, which cost 35 cents. And I read in high school to every single place I have lived. And there have been many. It's my whole life. That book is just, it's kind of a talisman to me. I, it's just, it's just so important to know where you came from. It's so important to know um, the violence of the world as well as the beauty of the world. And to, you know, there's a Jewish um, phrase, tikkun olam, which means repairing the world. And every Jew is given that assignment at birth. Um, it's expected, not expected that you do it alone, but it is expected that you play your part. And for me, my part in repairing the world, for better or for worse, is to write books that help people, the children especially, feel good about themselves and know that they belong. So that is um, what I have, that's my own assignment to myself and I will keep doing that. I have a couple of books coming out uh, in the next few years that have LGBTQ content. I have a couple of books coming out that have um, Jewish two mom families and Jewish two dad oh. families. So I'm very excited. I don't have to get those from my school. <laughs> right, right. The time has come. You know, I read books about Jewish families, books about two mom and two dad families. Now it's time to, to bring them both together. So I'm very excited about that. Um, well, thank you so much um, for agreeing to, to talk with me today and to, to tell us about your experiences writing books and, and having your books be challenged and um, all that goes along with it. Thanks, Danny. It was a pleasure. Um,